Hi there, I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is part three of a special edition of Rook. is Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian Obsession, Part 3, coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and Telegram. Also, for all our episodes in one place, you can see them at our website, rookmedia.com. So here's a little bit of what we heard on Part 2 of this series. You, you wake up and you have a message in from one of the people that inspired you to become an artist in musically, uh, socially, spiritually, in every way you can think. And there is this note from, from Roger that's gone out to the world of, of his support for us. Something that Iranians don't like is the distortion sound of guitar. So Pink Floyd has this pleasant, charming sound of the guitar. اون موسیقی راک و بلوزی که طبقه پایین جامعه در مثلا امریکا انگلیس اینا گوش میکردن اون موسیقی در ایران یک چیز دیگری بوده The first time I bought my electric bass I was in, in high school and the first song I started playing with that was Comfortably Numb On this episode we address drugs access and melancholy with Arash Sobhani in Stockholm, Siomak Shirazi in Portland, Oregon, Maral Mohammadi in London, and Ehsan Sadiq in Toronto. Here now is part three of Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian Obsession. go let's get to part three of our series our first guest in part three is a renowned musician producer television host he is the lead singer and guitarist of the underground rock band kiosk Arash Subhani was born and raised in Tehran and moved to the United States in 2005 to release Kiosk's first album, Ordinary Man. Since then, Kiosk have released nine albums and have toured all over the world. In 2019, Arash produced the hit series Persia's Got Talent for the MBC Persia Network. His other projects in TV include Noru Special, On 10 for VOA, and Studio 13 for Iran International. And right now, Arash Subhani joins me from Stockholm, Sweden. Hello, sir. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on your show. What a great pleasure it is to have you on to talk uh, Floyd. I, 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 I am very curious to hear your take on this hypothesis around the connection between Pink Floyd and Iranians. Let me start with this. You're a guitarist, you're a singer, you're a songwriter. How aware of Pink Floyd were you when you were growing up as a very little kid in Iran in the 70s and then the 1980s? Oh well, you know, uh, we all grew up with listening to our uh, to the cassette tapes that was left for us uh, from uncles, brothers, or whoever had left the country in '79, and they left a, a vast amount of music with them because you know music stopped coming to Iran uh, after the revolution. So Pink Floyd was uh, everybody had it, everybody listened to it. We grew up with it. We learned to speak English with the, with the songs. It was a huge influence, and I remember from the very first uh, basement jam sessions that we had, we tried to play Pink Floyd, uh, and, and still goes on. Still, when I'm at a party, people ask to, hey, "Can you do Wish You Were Here? Can you do this? Can you do that?" Yeah, so it's it's, and, it's and a big part of our music culture. So, so you were a fan. I am a fan. I am a fan of Pink Floyd, but I also do think that, uh, with all due respect, and all the you know, I've been to their concerts and I listen to them. Uh, from time to time, but I do think that they're disproportionately uh, bigger than everywhere else in Iran, Turkey, Lebanon, and those countries in the region. Okay, so let, let's get into that. Why do you think Iranians 
love Pink Floyd so much? Well, uh, it, it's it's really could be a, a, a subject for a book, I think. <laughs> you know, somebody has to do a proper research on it. But, you know, uh, I have my own theories that I've thought about throughout the years because I've also witnessed a lot of my friends, that, you know, who are really into music and listen to different genres. They start to hate Pink Floyd because there's so many, they, they hear it all the time when they, whenever they go and everybody's talking about them in Iran and they started to just kind of like start to dislike this band because it was so, uh, became a quiche almost. Right. Uh, but uh, I think it, it has to do with, uh, you know, I'm sure that everybody talked about the melancholy that's in the music and also with the, with the timing of the wall and the revolution and things like that. But, uh, but I think I have a couple other things I, I can add to this is, and one is, uh, I think you know, the music came to Iran, the music that came to Iran, the rock music that came to Iran, it, it was mostly the, the UK charts and Germany, especially. Uh, the music was, you know, people who traveled to Europe, they brought back music with them, LPs and cassettes, and, and there was less of American music. Uh, it was the, if, you know, the American music that got to Iran was through the musicians who were big in UK already, like Jimi Hendrix and those guys. And I'm talking about, you know, serious music. Uh, right people who, who really do this like religiously and uh, and germany has this huge traditional crowd rock you know it's very psychedelic it's and, and it's dates i think it outdates the british version and i think pink floyd was heavily influenced by by those bands like uh you know the crowd rock uh, musicians and 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 therefore pink floyd was huge in germany and and netherlands and a lot of those guys contributed to the music that came to Iran. So I think that's one of the reasons that some bands are very famous in Iran and nobody's ever heard of them in America, like Modern Talking. <laughs> yes. California and the concert, uh, my friends went to it and said it was only Iranians and Russians. There yes. was not a single American in the show. I can say to you as someone who's been immersed in music for a lifetime, I had never heard of Modern Talking when my cousin asked me if he was going to the <laughs> uh, to the concert last year when they came to Toronto or a couple of years ago. I And he was shocked. What do you mean, Modern Talking? And, and then I was to discover it's this horrible Euro disco, weird, uh, bad yeah. pop thing, but, but clear, clear. <laughs> clearly resonating for Iranians. So it was one of those things that got in there that's very distinct and different from Pink Floyd, of course. But Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I, I think the the fact that it's big in Iran is because it's, it was big in Germany but, uh, and it was big in uh, Turkey. Interesting. And that's where they brought the music from. And and, and also the other way around, like when I, when I went to America, uh, when I was a teenager the first time, uh, I went to a record store and I asked them, like, do you have Eloy or Jane? And they were like looking at me like, what the hell is that? Uh, and those are German rock bands that are very big in Iran again, oh. and nobody's heard of them in America. So I think the part of uh, the popularity of Pink Floyd has to do with the fact that the music came to Iran through uh, people who traveled to UK and Germany and, and Europe, mainly. Like That's Bruce Springsteen, people know him in Iran, but he's not... Uh, He's not the boss, you know. <laughs> so, 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 uh, could I just, uh, just to tr travel down that road for a second? Were Scorpions big in Iran? Oh, like, it's huge, yeah. Oh, Scorpions okay, huge. okay. And I, and so I think, that, and, and I think, with all the respect, again, I think they're the worst rock band ever. <laughs> well, yeah, they're and they're not that huge in North. I mean, they were pretty big, but not, you know, not huge. So no. I see. So there's a Germany Iran connection that we have to <laughs> to mine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. But but okay, let me just go two steps back though, because when you say the revolution happens, and we all know, you know, what happens around 1979, this this iron wall suddenly uh, um, upon culture, kind of everything stops, everything is retarded by the, a new suppressive, repressive culture that uh, doesn't allow for a lot of rock music, et cetera, to come into the country or to be made there. Um, so you say the older brothers and sisters and families are passing down cassettes. But clearly they weren't passing down the cassettes of the Rolling Stones or the Who. I mean, I'm bereft to remember any Iranians coming up to me, certainly not Iranians who are now in their 20s, 30s and 40s and saying, yeah, man, uh, uh, Exile on Main Street or some girls, these Rolling Stones, are, 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 they're my Bible. But they know Pink Floyd. They know the back catalog right. of Pink Floyd. They, so there was something even pre-revolution about Floyd that was resonating. That's very true. That's very true. And I think that that comes to the second reason that I believe it has contributed to this. And, and that's the drug culture that uh, was in Iran and, and goes very well with Pink Floyd music. I mean, when you listen to David Gilmour's uh, solos, you can almost smell the hash. 
and and I think that's that's what made it really attractive uh, among the music lovers in Iran because that was the uh, popular drug for the teenagers, and it was I think from what I heard I wasn't uh, into those things I was too young for that but. Uh, from what I heard, that that's you know they all have memories of oh yeah we went to some so and so's party we smoked some hash and we listened to Shine right. on Crazy Man right. it was such a trip and and that was the thing. Uh, that certainly resonates for me because growing up in 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 Canada in in my high school it was we were, we called it kind of a stoner school and and stoners were into Pink Floyd I mean you know we were a little young for the uh, 70s Pink Floyd but we would re re discover those records like a uh, uh, dark side of the moon or whatever but does drug culture how does drug culture intersect um with iran in the years after the revolution in the 80s and 90s was that a thing i, I mean i know people talk about drugs in iran now but what was the place of drugs in in those decades after the revolution yeah i think i think um you know w- when you listen to delta blues you can almost you know taste the bourbon or you you listen to Iranian traditional you can you can smell the opium and, and th- that really has I mean, the music has a really really tight connection with all these uh, alcohol and drug uh, uh, users and and but I think in the 80s also in like the 70s there was still uh, the culture of you know these traditional weed and, and and hash smokers that were around now like now it has changed a lot you know with all these chemicals and all these uh, stuff that people are doing right now with the pills and the ecstasy and these this and that but I think back then, still it was it was around, and it still was the culture. And and because the the name of the last album that was published before the revolution was the Wall, and people related to that so much, it also kind of like felt like okay, you understand what he's talking about, but without even knowing a word of English, you just knew you had to know the Wall. Um, I think all of those, the mixture of all these elements, kind of started to get Pink Floyd to a level of. A, uh, that is like I, I'm pretty sure if Roger Waters runs for president in Iran, Turkey, or Lebanon, he will win with no doubt. That's, yeah, and, I, uh, that certainly seems to be true. I want to get to the wall. Let me ask you first, as a musician and and uh, uh, with with someone who has a keen sense of musicality, why do you believe that Iranians gravitate towards? what is, I mean, these are reductive labels, but what has been called progressive rock. So you would include Pink Floyd in that, but a bunch of other bands that I'm noticing that Iranians of a certain vintage, millennials or Gen Xers know that you wouldn't really find the average Westerner, unless they're a real music fan or really into that genre would know. I mean, King Crimson or Yes, or these prog rock bands. What is it that Iranians have gravitated towards when it comes to that? Why, Why is that so appealing? Uh, I think part of it also has to do with our, uh, with uh, the, you know, Iranians just love nostalgia, and and because you know, time has frozen for us in 1979. It's like uh, for, um, every morning that uh, I think every Iranian wakes up every morning and thinking about like what happened on February 11, 1979. Still, we we can't believe it. And how did we do this? <laughs> how did this happen? So we were kind of got stuck there. And this this is the this is the this music takes us back to the good days in the 70s when people were like having fun and listening to Western music and then we're up to date and they were just stuck there, you know, like going to Cuba and seeing all these old cars with, with, with time stuff. Uh, I think nostalgia has a, has a lot to do with it. But you have a very you, you brought up a very good point that I don't have an answer for and, and I it beats me because the who and Tommy right. is a concept album, and it, and it's great, and it's and, I, and it's before the wall, or the album School by Supertramp, which Supertramp is big in Iran, but but still they they're not nearly anything close to to the, especially the Who. It's I don't I don't think people. But the really Who were a straight ahead rock band, even though very conceptual in some ways, et cetera. They don't f- fall as much in that they fall into what we you know in in the, in the West we call classic rock versus progressive rock, right? And right. and and, and it, it is very curious to me. I mean, I don't hear of a lot of young Iranian bands doing covers of Teenage Wasteland, you know, or, or uh, My Generation, yeah. but but yeah. they but wish you were here or you know songs from the wall another, another brick in the wall is, is our mainstay so there's something in the water there that we need to discover exactly i think it, it's it's a combination of different elements and that has made this band so popular in iran uh, to me it's the melancholy uh, tone and 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 uh, you know the the songs are really really dark and uh, Iranians gravitate towards that and nostalgia that brings back, you know, good old days when they listen to the song. Still, uh, you know, he, 
and 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 to be fair, uh, they have a great catalog, but the Wall is their most commercialized. I think the most pop sounding sounding uh, album. Yes, uh, but that's the biggest I think in Iran. Every Iranian is probably has heard of it or or, or has it, and you know, along with Agi Uzbe, Safar by Farmaz Aslani, all the guitar players know a song from the Wall and that song. As a guitarist, were you influenced by Gilmore? Are you somebody who would sit there and try and um, learn the, the 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 licks of David Gilmore, or as opposed to Slash or Eddie Van Halen or or Jeff Beck or Clapton or anybody else? Uh, honestly, not. Honestly, I I was uh, I was really. Uh, I mean, the reason I started playing guitar was because I heard Mark Knopfler on radio one day, and I just thought, you know, this is this is how the guitar should sound, and I picked up a guitar. And then later, I discovered Eric Clapton, and to me, he's he's just an amazing storyteller when he starts. To, uh, and and to me. Uh, I mean, again, I'm not some. I'm not at a level to to say these things about David Gilmour. He's an amazing guitarist, but I always think like it's the same melody, same same <laughs> lines every time, every single time, as opposed to Clapton that improvises. And every time you hear different, different, uh, it's the same story, but it's a different way of telling the story. You know, when you hear uh, his his hits. And Clapton is just like he becomes one with the guitar. He's not just performing as a piece that's written uh it's not as melodic it's more free form and, and i think that that was more attractive to me as a guitar hey, player man. i never never wanted to be like you, you've gilmore. crossed the line lay off gilmore all right he's a genius uh, yeah <laughs> well yeah, he is i mean uh no doubt but he wasn't like my role model as a right, guitar right right yeah let me let me ask you something uh or actually the the we do like to say as Iranians, and of course I think there's some merit to this, that we have this incredible tradition of poetry and um, and lyricism and that that has seeped through on through the, the years and the generations and it affects and infects everything that we find attractive. But I, I sometimes worry that that's a little self-congratulatory. You know, of course we like the profound things because we're so profound. Do you think, I mean, there is a theory that um, Iranians like Pink Floyd because of the the mysticism uh, and the poeticism of the of the lyrics. Do you think that there's something to that? No, I don't believe so because I think uh, I think I agree with you totally that we we kind of uh, we give to ourselves too much credit sometimes for for I mean we have a great literature history, don't no doubt, but so do the Japanese or the, the Armenians or you know other other countries that that have a rich history in, in literature, but. Uh, I was actually thinking about this when you when we started the discussion. Like someone like Bob Dylan, he's he's to me the ultimate poet. Or, right. Or, right. Uh, Cohen, well, Cohen is is more popular in Iran. But Bob Dylan, I one, one thing that when these younger uh, kids who are starting to write music come to me and say, okay, do you have anything to tell us? And I said, just go listen to Bob Dylan and see if you can internalize what he's saying and and try to try to do the same in Farsi and see how difficult that is and see how, how easily he goes from love to politics to, to death and, and, and it just all makes sense and it's so natural and it all so deep. Uh, but people in Iran are not really into that. I don't think they really listen to the lyrics because a lot of the lyrics that Pink Floyd has is really uh, not as deep as you think. You know, when something doesn't make sense, you can, you can feel like, okay, it, can, it might mean this or it might mean that <laughs> right, and you just right. get your own interpretation right, but right. bob dylan is is, is 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 the ultimate poet and and he's not as half as popular as, as and if it, but, and, and if it was just about the anti-establishment i mean i get that the wall came out in november 1979 there's an amazing in, uh, synergy there and and uh, this this record is almost like it's speaking for the iranian youth and of course then i mean we have the example of the the kids blurred vision who you know 10 years ago put out the hey ayatollah song and that yeah, becomes a yeah. viral hit uh, but you know there was a lot of there, there, there are i mean the clash are an anti-establishment uh, rebellious band but i don't I Again, if you just take any one of these elements, it's hard to make the case that that's the reason why, you know, they resonated for Iranians. Maybe it's the cocktail of all of them put together. 
I think it's the cocktail. I, I agree. I think it's the cocktail of all of them. And uh, I also think, uh, especially after the revolution, we had no music program in Iran. We had no critics, you know, like critics coming and talking about the albums and 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 you know saying, okay, this album came out. This is good about it. This is bad about it. You know, we we, we rated like this or that, and we didn't have anything. So it was just like word of mouth and and. And all the things that Pink Floyd talk about. And here's another criticism. I hope I hope I, I don't cross the line again. But one big criticism that I have for Pink Floyd is that all the things that they say in their lyrics. But look at it. Uh, look at the band. Um, they they didn't speak to each other for almost forty years. <laughs> right, right, uh, right. Rick Wright was not even a member of a band. You know, and, and there was so much you know d- dirt there under the rug that it just everything they say doesn't really really. Uh, stand up as, as as true when when it comes to themselves and brotherly love and you know you know roger waters is a pro hunting person and things like that you know it just doesn't add up um, i mean they're they're um, aristocrats i mean they're yes. actually you know they're uh, i don't even think they would shy from saying i mean they're elites you know they live in castles it's uh, exactly. uh, uh as they should as very successful businessmen and and musicians as well but uh, yeah but yeah they're they, they're interesting champions of the working people <laughs> yeah yeah, but I prefer the artist who actually lives it, lives what he says, and uh, I, I don't think. Um, yeah, so there's 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 a sense of sincerity that's sometimes missing, uh, especially in the later works. Although Roger Waters, of course, has been quite consistent about his politics, so you you, can, you sort of can't take that away from him. His consistency in terms of what he says over uh, over the years. Um, uh, you said something interesting. I'd be before I let you go. I'd be. Uh, um, it'd be remiss if I didn't pick up on this when they, with the opportunity to speak to you um, because because you're a great songwriter and, and you write songs that resonate for Iranians. You talked about how melancholy really um, um, resonates for Iranians. And, and this is this is true, you know, not, not even I mean, post revolution, you'd say, oh, that's because there was a revolution. There were executions. There was a war. There's economic disparity. But but it's true of the music before the revolution as well, that um, that songs are very sad. And even the songs that sound upbeat, when I learned the lyrics, I realized, oh, this is a very sad song. This is exactly. this is yeah. Can, yeah, have, have you discovered true. what that is? Why? Why? Uh, uh, we have this um, knee-jerk or reflexive kind of um, desire to consume melancholy material. Well, you know, it's it, again. It's I think it's a very deep conversation and, and, and discussion that, that probably there has been researchers on this. But I feel like it's like a football team that gets used to losing, and it just can't handle winning, and. Uh, I think that's the case with a lot of old countries like Iran, Egypt, and, and, and these older countries that have gone through a lot. You forget about your happy moments in life very quickly. You know, you think that's how life should be. But when you fail or when there's a scar, it stays with you and, and you just look at it and it's always there. And we have a lot of scars as a nation and we have a lot of uh, dark uh, um, episodes in our history that just stayed. And I think that's 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 the... That's the reason we kind of gravitate towards that kind of melody and music. And in, 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 I, I've been thinking about the concept of love in different nations and different people. And I think like the, the, the way Iranian poet and artist looks at it, it comes with a failure. It's never about mm. making it. It's always about losing it. And uh, that says a lot about uh, uh, culture, I think. And, and I hope we can change that. I, th- I hope that even if there are d- d- dark periods of... Uh, history or, or things that are not very, uh, I don't know, uh, upbeat, we can talk about them uh, in a different attitude, at least be optimistic or be hopeful. Uh, that's one thing that's missing. It's a powerful uh, metaphor, the football team metaphor, Arash. Um, yeah. Although it, I suspect you're, t- you're speaking about Arsenal, my team, so I get, <laughs> I get sad when you... you name <laughs> many names, but yeah, you said it. <laughs> Um, uh, a final question to you, uh, um, and, and I know this is these are not easy questions to to answer, but just from your own perspective as a musician uh, and somebody who's steeped in in Persian culture, uh, w- this disproportionate affection that Iranians have had for Pink Floyd. What do you think the impact of Pink Floyd has been on Iranian music on Iranian musicians in recent decades? Yes, I think I think they had a 
very powerful presence in in the underground music scene in Iran when I was growing up going to parties or going to jam sessions everybody played one number at least from Pink Floyd but I see that it's declining <laughs> and it's about time uh you know there are new sounds that coming uh, I think with the with the all the effects and technology that's coming people are and and internet of course you, you have access to more music and more uh uh compositions and sound effects and things like that and one other thing that maybe can 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 add i can add to to your first question about why pink floyd is popular is also about their amazing use of sound and uh bringing in like uh, different uh sound effects background sounds and stuff like that how they mix it with real life it became like part of a you know you were in the conversation with john lennon sitting there and stuff like that you do you, you could hear people talking you could hear the money you know in the money songs you could hear the coins and things like that i think that was very fresh and new but that has lost its appeal i think and and uh, and i see a lot of you know new bands that are kind of steering away from the pink floyd effect and and less and less pink floyd sound uh, comes out of there but still big and still huge Arash Subhani, I uh, I thank you so much for being part of this. You were very modest to, to say that uh, the experts will know more. You, your insights and your experience were great. It was great to hear you on this. Thanks, and I look forward to having you back on the show, my brother. Thank you so much. It was good talking to you. Bye-bye. 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 some early Floyd for you. You are listening to part three of a Rook special, Why Pink Floyd? An Iranian Obsession. We're coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and Telegram. For all of our episodes of this series and all of our episodes of Rook in general, you can see them, listen to them at our website, rookmedia.com. My next guest is an Iranian-American entrepreneur and philanthropist who has worked in the field of wellness-based medicine since the early 1990s. But in addition to his growing wellness-based medicine enterprise, Siomaka Shirazi is a musician, songwriter, and singer who has toured professionally after arriving in the United States in the 1980s and has recently been releasing new songs, including compositions and collaborations with the great Baba Kamini. Siomak is a long Time Pink Floyd fan and no stranger to interesting theories. Siamak Shirazi joins me from Portland, Oregon, right now. Hello, sir. Hello, Xian. How are you? I'm great. I I know you well enough to know you have theories. I know you well enough to know that you're a Pink Floyd fan. Uh, so I can dispense with the part about uh, 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 whether you know Floyd and whether you even know that there's a, a disproportionate connection between Iranians and Pink Floyd, it seems. So uh, let's get straight to you and Floyd, which is how aware of Pink Floyd were you before you arrived in America in the 1980s? Well, before we get to that, I should say that I am truly honored, Xi'an, to be a part of your program. As you know, I have been a fan of you uh, for years before Rook, and um, I really appreciate what you're doing with Rook. Thank you for inviting me. And now let's get into it. You're so kind. So. I'm, I'm tempted to end the interview right now because on a high, <laughs> on a high note before I hear your crazy Pink Floyd theories. But, uh-huh. but uh, <laughs> thank you. So you you invited me to be the crazy voice. <laughs> on the contrary, um, you're the soothing um, uh, 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 wellness guy. So, but uh, but 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 really, how how did you? When were you first aware of this band, Pink Floyd? Uh, probably when I was um, nine or ten years old, um, and my, I, I had an uncle who, at the time, was in his early twenties, 
and he listened to mostly um, non-Iranian music, uh, what came from the West. And through him, I was introduced to a lot of great Western music. And, and of course, Pink Floyd was at the top of the, the list. Um, yeah, and, 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 you know, from there, I started my own, if you will, discovery. Of course, we had limited resources, even before the revolution, especially for a, a teenager or a young kid. But yeah, I started my Pink Floyd journey at about 10 years old. Really? So even you, it wasn't just that you were exposed to them, uh, to them at 10, but you actually, the music appealed to you even as a 10 year old? It did. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, and interestingly enough, um, you know, most, most of my friends at the time uh, listened to Western music mostly to dance, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, some of us, there, there was a small group of us who listened to rock music. Uh, you know, psychedelic rock and, and Pink Floyd resonated with us probably because of their, um, you know, I, I go deeper into this. Uh, if you know, as you know, I, I sent you a preface to this book that one day you're going to write about this whole thing. <laughs> let me so let me give I, the background on this because you were you were actually one of the precipitants for me doing this special because I mentioned that I've got to write a book because I'm preoccupied with the connection that Iranians seem to have with Pink Floyd. And then you, I mean, we know each other. We've got each other's uh, contact information. You send me this this. Uh, you say, here's the introduction to your book, and this is where all your crazy theories about Pink Floyd uh, <laughs> were, put, were put on paper, but but they were tremendously interesting and and indeed a, a precipitant for for this special. So so let me get to that part, because um, you're, you're now talking about when you're 10 years old, I'm guessing that was the 1970s? Correct, yes. So, I, was, I'm, I was born in 1965, so okay. 1975, 1976. So there's, yeah. there's, cause there's, there's a lot of different theories that have emerged throughout this special, like, for example, that Pink Floyd wasn't um, anything special in terms of the uh, disproportionately more successful in Iran until after the revolution and after the wall. And then there are others, for example, Arash Sobhani said, no, this came out of the drug culture of the 70s of Iran and Pink Floyd were always big. And that's why after the revolution, brothers and sisters started to um, pass this, this down to their younger siblings and how the music got uh, traded and, and access to, to new generations. Uh, how about I just start off with the general question of why do you think Iranians love Pink Floyd so much? You know, some of you, what you said is actually very true in my opinion as well in terms of wall, the wall being the true connection or start of a true deeper connection uh, for, for the masses. Uh, not just in Iran, actually, probably the whole planet and, and maybe in the Middle East more, more so. Um, you know, it, I remember uh, when the wall came out, I was, uh, I was, of course, a teenager, but we lined up and it was at the beginning of the revolution. So the suppression of music was not there yet. It oh, was that's getting interesting. There. That's yes. so interesting because yes. it comes out November 30th, 1979. So, e so it's kind of mid-revolution. This hasn't occurred to me yet. So, so actually the wall technically probably was accessible for a few months before everything cracked down is what you're saying, yes? Very true, yes. And that also played a role into its fame because in a way it was one of the very last albums or, or you know, uh, works from the West that we were able to attain. Uh, and we lingered to it and listened to it because for a couple, three years actually, at the beginning of the revolution, things got really hard in terms of suppressing music. Uh, as you know, our friend Bobak has stories about how he carried his guitar in a garbage bag just because it was so hard, especially Western music sure. became this you know, element of West and, and they were trying to suppress it. But yes, so the wall was when we all started to have this kind of religious <laughs> relationship, if you will, with Pink Floyd because uh, the lyrics resonated with us so deeply, we started having uh, to do uh, to basically go through new educational reforms in Iran. And a year before we were studying English, for example, as a second language, and now we had to study Arabic. And not that there's anything wrong with Arabic, but for us, it was this um, thing that was forced down our wow. throat, yeah. you know, against our will. And and so we we hated it. Um, and and 
you know, of course, in some of their lyrics. <laughs> and, and I was talking to a friend of mine, I should say this, a few days ago, and I mentioned this is what I'm doing. And he said, of course, everyone knows why Pink Floyd is famous all over the world, because nobody wants to go to school. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so for us, it was a symbol of resistance in our mind, you know, especially the wall. So you're someone who, who firmly, you're in the camp that believes that the anti-establishment, anti-authoritarianism, anti-government, uh, anti-oppression kind of lyrics and rebellious sort of... Uh, undertone of the wall is something that resonated for it, and would do so through the 1980s then and and beyond for Iranian youth that was definitely a big part of it but also um you know I, I basically have two main theories as as I mentioned in my preface to your book <laughs> one <laughs> is this um utilitarian aspect of Pink Floyd's music and uh, as you know, I study, uh, and by the way, this is a disclaimer, I am not a, a Pink Floyd expert <laughs> to everyone. That's you okay. know, I got That's... myself into this because, um, you know, because of the art conversations, but right. I love them. Yeah. So I haven't studied Pink Floyd. There are people who have dissertations, PhD dissertations about Pink Floyd. But in my opinion, uh, yes, their music, so sound waves you know, travel through space by vibrating, uh, you know, air molecules. And, and when they reach our being, when they reach our body, they not only uh, enter our body through our ears, but they, they actually shake our entire body and our uh, entire being. So our whole being is affected by sound waves. In fact, you know, as you know, they use sound waves therapeutically for years and years now in medicine, you know, because of this quality of of you know sound waves uh, being able to affect our us at the cellular level so somehow pink floyd's music was able to do that with us uh, in an unconscious level and in my mind that explains the global thing you know uh, people didn't understand the lyrics really didn't even know the meanings of it or, or let alone the the rationale behind it or you know all this um kind of um cultural issues that pink floyd was singing about in their in their own uh, you know culture but it resonated with them just simply because somehow they were able to tap in to that part of m music as this sound wave which which kind of affects you and rattles you and shakes you okay but that wouldn't so, just be true of pink floyd that would be true of uh, uh, myriad other bands that um, play loud or interesting or atmospheric or rock music, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Pink Floyd is not the first one, but um, one thing was unique to them was the way that they utilize, you know, these long uh, stretch of instrumental musics uh, without any lyrics. Yes. And, and, you know, that, and their lyrics were very, very simple, actually, you know, very simplistic and brief and and they would it was like they were throwing this idea at you and then they will hit you with with a few minutes of really uh, beautiful music and um, that combination in my mind uh, didn't need the audience or the listener to understand the lyrics as much uh, to love it and to be affected by it. It's interesting and, that, you, that you should say, sorry to cut you off. It's interesting no that you should say the the last part there because there's been a suggestion that the traditions of Iranian uh, Persian classical music and even, even Persian contemporary pop music um, right up until at least uh, late era 70s stuff, uh, is steeped in long form composition, is steeped in these protracted pieces that um, can be improvisational, they can be quite long, they can uh, be meandering or uh, musically adventurous, and, and that that is more in sync with what Pink Floyd does or did in, in say, the 1970s than cookie-cutter pop songs. Does that resonate for you? Absolutely. That's actually uh, my, my second point <laughs> in my okay. argument. Uh, yeah, and, and that's very true. Because, you know, in a way, if you think about it, we were, um, so, so the act of listening to Western music, especially after revolution, post-revolution, and especially at the beginning, when they didn't want you to, was in a way uh, a, a countercultural act and rebellion act. 
So in, deep down, we wanted it to do this. And, and Pink Floyd allowed us to do that, to listen to Western music, but in a way, subconsciously, very similar to our own traditional Persian music, style of music. So I think for Iranians, that was another connection. That was another deep connection. And not just that, their lyrics, the, the mysticism that was peppered all over their lyrics, this existential crisis, these questions they, they kept ask of the authority or, or why or how, you know, we are here for what, you know, things like that. That was uh, our Iranian traditional music basically is made that way. Uh, they borrow lyrics from classics like Rumi, Hafez, Sadi, you know, as you know, and they write these long songs, several minutes long, sometimes even half an hour of, of um, you know, music with only maybe five or seven minutes mm -hmm. of lyrics mm -hmm. in it. And that was very similar to what Pink Floyd did. So it gave us that deep unconscious connection with our root, which was, you know, culturally, music was to stimulate uh, the spiritual part of you, uh, but also we were able to listen to rock and roll. I love the opportunity to ask you these questions because you were a rock singer. You were there. You were there at the exact time. You're in your late teens by the late 70s mm -hmm. when all of this is happening. Uh, one question I have with respect to the the rebelliousness, the, the anti-establishment, as even leading up to the revolution you say you think of the but the, the the fervent sort of anti uh, authority or you know uh, let's overthrow the monarchy sort of mood in the streets of some youth at least in the 77 78 why wouldn't punk rock appeal to people i mean what where were the sex pistols or the clash you know uh, who obviously had put out records by that time that were popular um, or becoming gaining popularity in the west um, why wouldn't if if people were gravitating towards rebellious stuff where was that? Well, as as you know, I we did listen to all of that. It was not that we only listened to Pink Floyd, and they all had their their room, you know, their their place. But uh, maybe Pink Floyd was different because how in our traditional music we we separate someone like Mr. Shajarian with the rest. Um, you know, there everyone has a voice and everyone has something to say. But it, most of their music was love songs, ballads, you know, about uh, human connections, in a, if you will. Right. Pink Floyd in, was, was kind of unique uh, of asking these existential questions and, and go deeper. Uh, their, their lyrics were very philosophical, you know, and at least for us, we, we perceived it like that, you know. So I think, you know, and, and um, there are a couple of examples even before revolution, I, I exactly vividly remember uh, sitting in, in my uncle's car driving in Tehran when there were a lot of protesting happening. And, and he was young and I was, you know, go wherever he went. And we went to see what's going on, basically. And um, he was playing, you know, animals. <laughs> and we were listening to, have you heard the news? The dogs are dead. <laughs> you know, you better stay home. And do as you're told, get out of the road if you want to grow old. So even before revolution, we thought, hey, they, are, they made this song for now, for what we are dealing with right, you know right there's a, there's another layer of the music that they were making in the 70s that would um then continue through the through the 80s and beyond uh that that um Arash Subhani, who was just on uh, on this part three before you, obviously he's a musician and has um, his take on um, the dominance or the interest in Pink Floyd in Iran. And he talked about the melancholy nature of the sound of their music and their lyrics. Mm. And that mm. that is something, I know you know this intimately, but that is something that Iranians have gravitated towards for decades, if not forever, I guess. I don't know. Uh, you'd have to tell me. But, but this notion that we on some level and for a number of different reasons um, 
are attracted to sadness, sad lyrics, sad melodies, or sad messaging, and that that, mm-hmm. or, or at least melancholy, and that that is something that we could find in, you know, through the grooves of, of Dark Side of the Moon. Um, talk to me about that and whether that makes sense to you. Hmm. Yeah, that it's th- we are getting into an interesting territory because um, it's a cultural phenomenon for us to appreciate um, or, or to connect sadness to depth um, in in music, in poetry, in art in general, uh, and this is a very Iranian thing, actually. Um, somehow, I don't know how uh, or when, maybe because of the, maybe it's post-Islamic. This is just something that I, I'm k- coming up with right now. But maybe because of, of the suppression, again, of religious, uh, you know, um, studies or, or, you know, practices, maybe we came up with this uh, connection with melancholy and sadness as something valuable, deep, uh, to cherish uh, and and happiness and joy and dance as something superficial. Um, in in fact, if you go back to even pop music of the seventies, famous singers like Darius and and Satar and Ebi and Gugush, most of their songs, maybe not not much Gugush, but the, the guys yeah. uh, was you was you know, sad. Yeah, 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 pretty much exactly, exactly. Yeah. And 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 I, I fall in love with you, and and uh, <laughs> as the result. You know, I'm going to become, I don't know, heroin addict and I'm going to kill myself pretty right. much. You know, that was, um, and and um, I think it's because, you know. But even even, even int- the upbeat stuff after, like, uh, uh, what's that song? Like, that's played at weddings. Yeah. And, and yeah, the right, lyrics are right, like, right. you know, you were always leaving me. I, you know, I'm, you're, you're, you're a traitor. <laughs> like, I, our relationship is over. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, this thing, you know, this, this gravitation towards just like the morbid, the sadness. But. That makes a lot of sense if you listen to. I mean, I don't think you need to just listen to Floyd and be be. I mean, there's a way to listen to Mike to, to, to Pink Floyd and not be sad at all. But it feels like melancholy music, doesn't it? It does. It does. And and actually, their lyrics, um, as as the the gentleman you were talking about mentioned, most of it is not, not happy stuff. You know, most of it is longing. It's sad. It's um, you know, questioning life in general and that i'm sure had a lot to do with their fame in iran because uh, we associate that to depth and and we we all feel good better about listening or at the time i should say as a young teenagers we want to act older than our age and more sophisticated you know and um in, in deeper connection with life and the meaning of life so that was a way for us to display that listening to stuff like pink floyd or even our traditional music um gave us that opportunity that outlet when you first arrive in america i remember the story that you you end up in california you, you you're completely new to the country you don't you know you're trying to figure out uh, where you fit in how you fit in all that but you're this musician you're this little rock and roll kid um you're still very young you end up touring with Vigan in California, <laughs> uh, like as his opening act. Um, I, I'm just wondering, did you like? Would you cover Pink Floyd at that time? Would would Pink Floyd music even enter into what you guys would be doing around that time? Unfortunately, no, I did not. I I did sing other English songs, but not Pink Floyd because L.A. culture of the 80s, it was 1985, 86, um, was not really, didn't want to, didn't want to do that, didn't want to deal with that. They, everybody was there to party. Everybody was there to have fun and to kind of, uh, they, they celebrate this um, uh, kind of uh, fleeing the suppression or death in, you know, because when I got to U.S., Iran was in the middle of a war sure. with Iraq, and, sure. and I actually lost a great friend of mine in that war. So it was like you literally, um, you know, could die in Iran, so you were celebrating life um, in this place that everybody thought it was heaven. Um, but no, unfortunately, I didn't sing any Pink Floyd, but I did sing other 
Western songs. And, and one of the songs that I sang actually, um, maybe not very much known by Westerners, was Prison Song which was sang by Nash, and it was written about kids putting in, being put in prison because of drug charges in the U.S. You know, very, very minimal drug charge, but for years, 10, 10 or 15 years. And that resonated with, with me because my friends were put in jail for, I don't know, having a long hair or listening to music loud in their car and so on. And so. In fact, I, was, I have gotten into trouble several times in Iran. I was thrown out of university because of that. Um, one of my poems, I was writing poetry at the time, uh, you know, got me into trouble. So there's stuff like that, uh, that, you know, we revolted against and felt like, you know, when I got to U.S., I just had to live up as much as I could. Uh, you, you, so. you might know this because you've been in the West for, you know, three decades or so. But uh, in the West, or see, growing up as a kid for me in the 80s, getting to know, you know, of Pink Floyd, it, there was very much an association with drug culture. You know, I, I went to what I've, I've said this a couple times on this, but like a, a stoner high school where, you know, <laughs> and, and there was a lot of like, you know, Floyd, like you'd, it'd be like people with a jean jacket and long stringy hair and like Floyd sort of written on the back of the jean jacket and like, you know, you'd smoke a joint and listen to Floyd. That was the, or, or, or much more so do like hallucinogenic drugs or something. There's been a couple of folks who've spoken to this on this special saying that actually there was that kind of drug culture in Iran, especially in the 1970s, that is where there was an, also an intersection with Pink Floyd. Um, does that make sense to you? It does, for sure. Yes. Um, you know, uh, pot uh, in general was just introduced to Iran in the late 70s, early 80s, um, you know, at least in a, in a more um, kind of uh, mass or easier to reach way. Uh, and um, that had a lot to do with not just Pink Floyd, but psychedelic rock in general, you know, bands like Deep Purple, um, you know, Led Zeppelin. We, we listened to them. Um, sometimes when we got high on, on grass, on weed. For me, that was it. I, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, didn't, didn't go any further than that. But, mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to this idea of, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm above this, uh, you know, earthly stuff. I'm, uh, you know, I, I can see through the meaning of life even when I'm 17 or 18, uh, especially when I'm high on pot and <laughs> listening to Pink Floyd. So it definitely had a lot to do with gravitation, gravitating to Pink Floyd or psychedelic rock in general. Sure. I just want to drill down a little bit more because it's just so interesting to me. So you line up for the wall in, in late November of, uh, <laughs> assuming, assuming yeah. the album came out in Iran at the same time it was released in other places uh, because it was, its official release date was November 30th, 1979. So let's say it came out within that time period or a couple months later or whatever, but it's before you say uh, everything shuts down in terms of access to music in Iran. So, so what happens immediately in the next, few years this is endlessly interesting for me as and very sad for somebody who didn't grow up there i'm always curious how music was accessed how it was passed along how people even discovered bands like uh, pink floyd after the you know the the iron curtain of sorts whatever you want to call it the uh, every after the the sort of state shuts everything down um talk to me about those early years before you come to the united states and how music was traded how you even found things like pink floyd sure um well obviously before revolution there were few outlets um in, and, and i grew up in tehran i was born and raised in tehran so tehran had several uh record stores um and and beethoven actually i believe still exists to this day which was um one of the most famous ones especially for classic classical music but they had all kinds of music uh, the one that I went to as a kid was this place called Ali Qapu. Um, and it was inside of Bazar Safavie, which was a kind of a hip uh, boutique style, you know, mall in, uh, in Iran, in Tehran. And um, what they did is they used reel to reel. And, and they somehow got these albums. Um, and, and this was all bootlegged. I'm sure they never got any. Pink Floyd didn't get a send a royalty from what happened in Iran. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, but but they use and then they produce cassettes. Um, you know, bootleg cassettes. Sorry, this is this is after the revolution now, right? This is after the revolution. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
So, so h- and, how can and, sorry? Uh, forgive me for if these are naive questions, but how can a store that sells music exist if if music was against the law? Or sure, you, I was getting to that oh, okay. for the for, for for about a year, Jean, after the revolution, things actually were very free. Um, where they were even freer than be- you know previously before revolution. Uh, we went through this very brief, unfortunately, brief, brief period of of freedom in Iran. Uh, the press and and social gatherings and, and political uh, organizations, we had several of them publicly, and it lasted, I want to say, maybe a year uh, or a little more than a year, and then it all sh- got shut down very heavily. And then we, we went through two or three years of suppression after that, and then uh, right around 1980, I believe, is when the war started with the Iraq, Iran, Iraq war. And that all kind of made things even more uh, closed and suppressed. So Ali Rapu was was still selling records um, up to maybe 1980, 1981, I want to say. And then it was closed after that. Or or I should say maybe it wasn't closed, but it was only allowed to sell Iranian traditional so music. Nazi, right, right, right. You know, so we still, that, that's how we got access. And then after that, a friend of a uh, few, we had all had friends who had reel to reel in their homes, and then somebody smuggles a, a, a cassette, and cassette was the main form of music at that time. The music got got massively, you know, produced, uh, or um, yeah, and then they would uh, kind of bootleg it and then sell it or give it away. And that's how music got out. But um, and, and sorry, what was your question? No, this is, I was, this is exactly what I was asking about, how how music was accessed oh, okay. in those early yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, it is so interesting getting to talk to you. You are so, uh, we could just do this entire <laughs> special with you. Um, and uh, we should do an entire special with you. L- uh, let me end by, or or at least end this, this conversation for now. I'm sure it will continue off the air <laughs> and on future episodes. Uh, by asking you, what era of Pink Floyd now? What is the album that really sticks with you? What is the song if you were to go home and want to put something on and close your eyes and let your mind expand um, with the help of drugs or not? What what is the um, what is the one that sticks out for you now? Uh, well, this is a little personal, actually. Um, the, the, I had a friend who who lost his life in um, the war that we fought with Iraq for a number of years. And um, we used to listen to Pink Floyd together. Um, and um, th- we actually listened to Wish You Were Here uh, together. Wow. And um, yeah, and, and one, of the fir- one of the first things I did actually um, when I got to U.S. was I, I went... Um, to Pacific Coast Highway with this little rinky dinky car that I had, and and uh, it didn't have a stereo, so I borrowed someone's Walkman, a friend's Walkman, and uh, listened to "Wish You Were Here" while I was walking on the beach um, in his memory. And to this day, that is the song for me. Um, you know, uh, but but I I love "Dark Side of the Moon." Um, you know, I I even like their their stuff after. 19 after the wall which was mainly you know david gilmer mm-hmm. and nick mason yeah. and yeah. roger waters didn't have much to do with it and in fact i went to their concert in la um they had this album um division bell yeah I yeah believe. i saw that tour yeah, too yeah, yeah. 94 yes. 95 yeah. yeah yeah and and um yeah and and um so i i like everything they do uh, you know if they roger waters is here i'll go see if pink floyd is here whoever is here um, but yeah, Wish You Were Here is personal to me because of Saeed, because of my, my friend who lost his life. That's a, a beautiful story. Again, I so much appreciate the time you've taken, your insights, and um, uh, it's really nice to have you on Rook, my friend. And I look forward to more, and I look forward to seeing you in person. You take care of yourself in Portland. Thank you. Same to you, brother. Chodafes. Chodafes. So, so you think you can tell Heaven from hell Blue skies from pain 
Can you tell a green field from a cold steel rail? A smile from a veil. Do you think you can tell? Did they get you to train your heroes for ghosts? Hot ashes for trees, hot air for a cool breeze, cold comfort for change. Did you exchange a walk on pie? listening to part three of a Rook special series, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession. If you like what you're hearing and you want to hear more from Rook, you can subscribe on any of our platforms, SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, Telegram. You can subscribe on all of them, actually. (laughs) And also find all of our episodes, including all of the episodes of this original series, at our website, rookmedia.com. There's a whole page devoted to this special there. Our next guest is a musician and TV producer and host based in London, England. Marol Mohammadi was born in Tehran, where she studied music. She moved to London to continue her studies in cello performance and composition. After getting her master's, Marol worked as a cellist and composer for many years, collaborating with prominent artists such as Mark Lockhart, Radio Tehran, Mohsen Namju, the Pupini Sisters, Dang Show, to name a few. She has performed and has had her music performed in Iran, England, Scotland, Germany, USA, Israel, and more. And in 2016, she started producing music shows for Manoto Television and is now producing a culture show for the Iran International Network. But right now, Maral Mohammadi joins me from London. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. What a pleasure it is to have you as part of this special. Listen, you you grew up in in Iran. Do do, do you remember when and how you may have discovered Pink Floyd when you were a kid or a teenager growing up in Iran? Yes. Well, I had um, my uncle uh, was into rock music and he was into like dance, break dancing. Like he was the cool cool kid of the family uh, so anything cool like this came to the house via him uh, and he's only about like maybe 15 years older than me and after him uh, it was my brother he's five years older than me and he's my idol and anything he liked I liked by default even if I had no idea what it means or why we like it like if he liked it I liked it um, and again the uh, Pink Floyd was one of those um, artists that he liked and it was played in the house a lot. And um, yeah, I remember kind of getting into it with him, pretending I understand when I was like eight. (laughs) Um, It's like, yeah, this is cool. Yeah. And I would talk to my friends at school. Did you know Pink Floyd? And no one had no idea because we were eight. <laughs> right, um, right. But yeah, it's I, I, I do remember. I, I even remember what house we were in oh, when wow. I first, uh, like I remember my room. Although Ramin Sadiri said earlier that uh, he first got into Pink Floyd when he heard them at the age of five. So I think he wins the prize for uh, <laughs> earliest yeah, Floyd wow, fan. That and, is, yeah. yeah, For, for yeah. those of us who grew up outside of Iran and, and um, are endlessly curious about uh, the nature of what happened post-revolution in terms of the way culture um, made its way into the country, how would, I mean, assuming that you're, you know, you and your brother are growing up after the revolution in Iran, how, how would he access Pink Floyd? Like, uh, really, technically? Um, it was like one person who would have a copy via a family member that lived outside Iran, and they would make copies, and they would be the coolest person in the uh, in that group of friends. And if they are gre- great, like, if they were kind enough, they would let you make a copy of their album. Mm. Um, and and I remember getting like I remember my brother would have his friends over because he had the tape and they would listen to it in his room because he didn't like he, he wanted to stay the coolest one and he wouldn't and we didn't even have a tape recorder that would record into another 
um, right. tapes. So people would get like my our friends and my brother's friend would get together in one room to listen to this. Um, and it was just a copy that you would get from someone who had it. There was no way that you could really get an original or and if someone had the copy that had the lyrics in it that was like oh my god <laughs> um it was like it would make you a king or a queen to to be that cool to know exactly what the lyrics are saying and to have it written and and moral have you have you thought about what do you think it is that leads iranians to love pink floyd so much i think the obsession with pink floyd um, is more with the album The Wall than Pink Floyd alone. But I think it's it's a lot of the messages that they have in the lyrics that young people and kids growing up in Iran with during rev revolution, after the revolution, all the oppressions, all the lack of everything, yeah. like every, the people being thirsty for something um, that would uh, kind of speak what they are feeling yes. is, is one of the reasons. I think they're lyrics. And also there is a simplicity and the melodic side of their music, I think relates to Iranian youth um, a lot. It's it's easier to follow. It's easier to connect with mm. uh, because of their melodies, and and the melodies makes the the harmony and and the um, like the arrangements easier to digest. Um, so I think it's the melodies and the lyrics. You talk about the wall, and obviously, I mean that was an internationally uh, hit, recognized album. But Pink Floyd, I "Wish You Were Here," "Dark Side of the Moon," mm. these were huge albums as well. Uh, mm. There is a theory that some have that there was something significant about the wall coming out at the same time as the revolution in Iran, and that that uh, the anti-establishment, uh, um, anti-elite, anti. Um, um, repression uh, message of the wall uh, is really what was what, what Iranians were responding to, and then it became it sort of started to flow into the DNA of Iranian youth. Do you do you think that that is the case? I do, yes, um, because it was like it was. It, it came out the year of the revolution. It came out like months after the revolution, um, and and when the film came out. Also, like it was shown to Iranian kids or young youth from that time seeing this. They were seeing what they wanted to say. They were seeing the explosion that they wanted to be able to have, all the all the anger that they had towards the establishment, the, the one before the revolution and after the revolution and during, like then it, then it was the war. And then all of that anger and energy was kind of blown in their face through this this album and the film. Yes. What about musically when it comes to progressive rock? It's, it's interesting. You said earlier there's a simplicity to Pink Floyd. I think you're 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 absolutely right in, in in terms of some of the melodies. But really, compared to say a lot of the classic rock of the same era, especially going into the '80s, Pink Floyd music is is quite complex. There's depth there. There's fusion complexity, and it seems like there's a yearning amongst Iranians for. Um, some depth when it comes to, I mean, maybe not in the real pop pop stuff that we've heard the Persian <laughs> pop, but uh, but when it comes to rock music, maybe there's a yearning for real depth. What do you think of that? Yes, I think that comes from um, the importance of lyrics for Iranians in general. Like though, even those pop pops that you said, there are ones that like if you listen to the music, it's just so bad. The production is so weak. Right. It's just like awful. But the lyrics speaks to people, and in in groups like Pink Floyd, that like you said, their lyrics is is quite sophisticated and and deep, and it has um, more than one meaning, and it's it kind of tells a story. It makes it more um, appealing because it's. 
they they care about what the person who's speaking is saying sometimes even more than what the music right, um right. is trying to say and the i mean when i said that the simplicity about pink floyd i only meant the the melodies like right, the fact that right. the melody is so followable in a way right. um that kind of makes the complex um of the music and the arrangement easier to digest and and they can kind of um connect with the music easier what do you think um uh, you're you're a musician when when i think about the cello i always think about cinematic kind of music and and i would call pink floyd cinematic music I, do, what do you think the impact of pink floyd has been if you if you have an opinion on this on iranian musicians I think a lot. Um, like I remember, like occasionally, if a party was happening at our house, and I would be able to see, like, listen to them from my room. Um, there was all like I could tell they they would start by covering their like Pink Floyd music, <laughs> and then they would play something that they wrote themselves, which you could definitely, even as a child, you could tell that it is it comes from the same. Um, umbrella of of uh, musical taste, so I do think that definitely, especially musicians who were starting around that time, around like in the in the eighties, definitely a very strong influence that that Pink Floyd had on them. It's a good pleasure getting to talk to you about this. I thank you for this. You know, it's interesting to me, like when when we talk about a. a repressed culture and i mean not to take anything away from the beautiful persian and iranian culture that we love but but we know you know post revolution there a repressed popular culture um where there just isn't access to all that's being made or a, everywhere else in the world let alone uh, access within the country to be making you know rock albums or or, or what have you um it's so interesting to see what pops up and what becomes um what, as I said earlier, runs through the DNA then of the of the culture and the youth culture, and that Pink Floyd yeah. has become one of those things that popped up. They, they, they might be even more subtle reasons that they became as big as they, they have for Iranians, like even the relationship, like what happened to Sid Barrett and and the the dynamic between Roger Waters and and David Gilmore, like. Even those those little things that that happened between the band members may have been one of the reasons that um, like it could have had an effect on how popular they became. Like we we need to remember that this was the time that in Iran it was not easy to have news about these people. Yes. Like if an album yes. would come out, it would like we would hear about it. But it was like everything was with delay and every tiniest bit of information that we heard about how this, like even the name of band members. I remember when I um, found that out or the fact that like I didn't know for a very long time that there was a Sid Barrett before, uh, you know, there was like right. this other guy. And so all of these things that you, we found out kind of added to the, um, like added reasons to why they became so big for us. And would I you think. have found out that uh, Masanke Roger Waters is supportive of um you know reform or change in Iran or you know uh, would you have, his politics would you have known about that? Back then no. Right. I had no idea the you know I I learned I, don't, I don't know if he had a lot to say about it back then but he certainly did I don't when know. when the yeah. green movement happened you know and he was quite outspoken about um uh, supporting folks in the streets and I remember I, I went to there to his gig in London a few like I don't remember when it was um but yeah like we were so amazed that there, there, there were pictures of uh, people who died in the green movement there was like a Neda picture there was like and we're like, oh yes, that's our people. He's supporting us. It and it was amazing that I went like I went to that gig with uh, three Iranian friends and one uh, English friend, and uh, he was amazed that we knew all the lyrics and <laughs> we knew. And he was like, "This is a band from my parents' generation. Like, it's, why do you guys care about them? Right, why do you right, why?" Right. Um, it was it was very interesting, and in the, in the gig in O2, which is like this huge arena, concert yeah, hall, and yeah, yeah arena, uh, everyone was speaking Farsi. Like you would walk, and you would hear more Persian than English. Fascinating. <laughs> it's such a it's such a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for making the time. Thanks for being part of this special, and I hope we do a a proper longer chat uh, before too long. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, it's great talking to you. Bye bye. Check out all your girlfriends with you Mama won't let anyone dirty get through Mama's gonna wait up until you get in and Mama will always find out where you've been Mama's gonna keep baby Listening to part three of a Rook original series, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession. This part dealing with drugs, access, and melancholy. Coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and Telegram. Also, for all episodes in one place, you can see them at our website, rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com. Our final guest in this part three is a composer, a guitarist, and a photographer. He was born in 1980 in Kerman Shah, and he holds a degree in photography. Ehsan Sadiq is the founder of the contemporary jazz ensemble, the Ehsan Sadiq Trio, and the group Quartet Diminished, with whom he has performed and toured around the world. Currently, Ehsan is working as a music composer for films and theater and is the leader of Quartet Diminished, but right now, Ehsan Sadiq joins us from Toronto. Hello, sir. Hello, Gian. I'm Salam Mekonam Beshama and Shanavandan Great to have you on the program. Uh, to, to have the chance to speak to you. Uh, first things first, Esan, you're, you're a guitarist, albeit in the jazz realm. How aware of Pink Floyd were you when you were growing up uh, in Iran as a kid in the 1980s? Usulan Pink Floyd, گروهیه که نمیشه از تأثیراتش خلاص شد و در واقع همه گیتاریستا همه موزیسین ها به یه نوعی یه روزی بالاخره پینک فلوید گوش میدن و باهاش آشنا میشن مثلا به عنوان مثال زمانی که شما داری گیتار یاد میگیرین و تلاش میکنین که گیتار الکتریک خصوصا بزنین حتما روزی میرسه که یه سری به دیوید گیلمور میزنین و آهنگ شاینان و کریزی دایمند رو سعی میکنین کاور بکنین و خب من هم مستثنا نبودم و پینک فلوید برای من این خاصیت رو داشت که علاوه بر این که ازش لذت میبردم سعی میکردم کاور هم بکنم that's amazing. So it's a it's a rite of passage as an electric guitarist in Iran to to have to learn the, the David Gilmour chops, huh? Uh, <laughs> so do, do do you remember when you first heard Pink Floyd or how you first heard? For those of us who didn't grow up up in Iran after the revolution, it's always curious to me how people accessed music. Where did you find Pink Floyd music in say the 1980s or even in the 1990s? در واقع پینک فلوید از اون گروه هایی بود که شاید برای من و خیلی ها اینجوری باشه که حتی یادشون نیاد که اولین بار کی شنیدن چون خب خیلی پینک فلوید بود یعنی در مثال های خیلی کودکی هم به هر حال این برانور پینک فلوید شنیده میشد و میتونم بگم یادم برای اولین بار کی مثلا گریت فول دد شنیدم یا کی جفرسون پلین شنیدم ولی دقیقا یادم نمیاد کی پینک فلوید شنیدم منتها اینکه ما چه جوری این آلبوم ها رو در واقع بعدن که خب علاقه من شدیم به شکل آلبوم موزیکا رو دنبال کنیم و جدی تر از کجا این موزیکا رو پیدا می کردیم خب یه روشش دوستان بود یه روشش یک سری موزیک فروشی های زیر زمینی بود مثلا فرض کنیم مثل استودیو زند که موزیکایی که 
رو نوار ضبط کرده بودن و هنوز یه مقداریش بود از دست فروش یا دست فروشی من داشتم تو میدون ونک که هر روز میرفتم ازش میخریدم و یا صفحه هایی که پیدا میشد تو انبار پدرهای دوستان یا برادرهای بزرگترشون Esam, one of the things that has been my question for a few people that we're speaking to as part of this series is why progressive rock is something that resonates so much for Iranians or why it's been the, um, the, 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 the place where if you situate Pink Floyd there, where Iranians have been felt the most connection in, in the rock world. You know, from the outside, it's very curious, for example, to think, why didn't the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or U2 um, become uh, huge household names in Iran the way Pink Floyd are? I mean, those are those are globally celebrated bands that are as big or bigger than Pink Floyd. But um, you heart, you're hard pressed to find Iranians outside of real music fans or musicians who even know the back catalogs of any of those bands. What is it about Pink Floyd's sound and I guess the progressive rock genre that would set them apart from other huge classic bands? Two um, reasons, Pink Floyd better, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, spoken like a true uh, fan. <laughs> okay, uh, all right. Uh, I'm a fan of Pink Floyd, but I can say that Pink Floyd is a lot better than U2. The next thing is that we have in Iran, or before or after the war, we have a group of people که احتمالا همه جای دنیا دارن یک طبقه فرهنگی که طبقه فرهنگی متوسطه <تصفيق> و اینها معمولا تحصیل کردن و اینها این, این طبقه یک نشونه هایی همیشه از خودش بروز میده اینکه شما چه کتابی میخونین چه موزیکی گوش میدین چه فیلمی میبینین <تصفيق> یه یک یک همچین فضایی هم طبیعتا در ایران بوده آها اینم بگم که اصولا شما وقتی که یک یک فضای اعتراضی دارین چه در شعر چه در ادبیات چه در موسیقی حالا به هر نوعش این یک کمی بیشتر با به طبع اون طبقه متوسط فرهنگی یعنی این حرکت اعتراضی و پینک فلوید این خصوصیت اعتراضی رو داره و داشته و این, این طبقه به اون سمت جذب شده و لزوما خیلی هاشون پینک فلوید رو خیلی خوب هم نمیشناختن اینو به این دلیل میگم که شما اگه دو بخش بکنین تاریخ موسیقی پینک فلوید رو یعنی از آلبوم پایپر ات گیتس اف داون تا مثلا آلبوم ات دارک ساید اف مون قبلش یک بخش عمده ای از این از ایرانی هایی که پینک فلوید رو میشناسن یا شنیدن یا یه جایی راجع بهش صحبت میکنن این آلبوم ها رو نشنیدن یعنی course, مثلا آلبوم آلبوم اوماگاما رو نشنیدن no, مثلا no, no. خیلی به مدل علاقه ای ندارن ولی اون چیزی که تو پینک فلوید پینک فلوید رو برای ایرانیا و احتمالا خیلی جاهای دیگه دنیا پینک فلوید میکنه دواله که در واقع یک فیلم و یک کارگردان خیلی مهم کمک میکنه به اینکه اونها در واقع این وچه رو پیدا بکنن بین این آدم های طبقه متوسط که دوست دارن نشون بدن که متفاوت هستن و پینک فلوید یکی از, این، یکی از کارهایی که میکنه اینه You know, you make a very good point to, to make the distinction of the different eras of Pink Floyd because the the pre Dark Side of the Moon, the the late '60s and early '70s, the Sid Barrett years, especially in the first few couple of records, mm-hmm. it's very experimental music and it's very mm-hmm. um, extreme progressive, you might say, in terms of the the rock metal genre and psychedelic yeah, genre. Yeah, it's more uh, psychedelic, British psychedelic. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. What what would you say? 
Uh, I mean, now just speak to me as a musician be, beyond any analysis of Cherry Irania, Pink Floyd, Dusarina, but just like mm -hmm. as a musician, wh what influence, what impact has this group, this music had on you? Shojaat va jesarat. On chiziye ke dar musiqi Pink Floyd dar sakhtar musiqishun vujud dare. این که مجله رولینگ ستونز میگه The Dark Side of the بهترین آلبوم تاریخ پراگرسیو راکه من قبول ندارم بهترینه ولی میتونم بگم که یکی از بهترین از, از نظر شجاعت در ساختن یک همچین بافتی Very well said, sir. Do you, do you have a, um, uh, we're going to play some music going out. Do you have a particular um, song or moment in the Pink Floyd album that you um, think of when you think of your favorite Pink Floyd music? Um, shine on a crazy diamond. Yeah. Come on. All right. yeah. Well, we'll play a bit of that. Esson Sadiq, it's such a pleasure. Merci. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Khayli um, khoshashidam. I hope we speak again soon, brother. Merci. Bakhudam. Like the sun This is full time for part three of our special series, Why Pink Floyd. This part was dealing with drugs, access, and melancholy. On part four, we address storytelling, classics, and conclusions. Remember, you can find all four parts of this series at our website, rookmedia.com, where you can also find our other episodes, subscribe, and become a patron to support us. Thank you so much for listening to this and to share for sharing our content and Thank you to the amazing Rook team for working on this. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Mizunbashi. Mizunbashi.